change Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Sri Yushupanishad, all his important books, Brahma Samhita. Huh? Well, I mean, doesn't that mean they're teaching something different? They're, they're saying something different? They're putting different words in Srila Prabhupada's mouth than he himself would have chose or did choose? You see? This is a clear indication that they are changing the teachings. But what is the need to change a teaching that's eternal? What is the need to change the absolute truth? The absolute truth is always true. But why, why, would, why would we need to change it? See? This is the principle of Arsha Prayoga. Arsha Prayoga means that the great sages and gurus, when they write something, even if it's wrong, it's right. <laughs> even if it's wrong, by some calculation of literary rules and, uh, or uh, some tradition or, or, or um, some standard that may exist, uh, either now or at a different time. Whatever they write, just leave it alone. It's not yours to change. If you think that things should be different, you write a commentary and put your name on it. Huh? I wrote my own commentary on Vedanta Sutra, and I put my name on it. Yes, it was based on Valadev Vidyabhushan's commentary. Uh, but I added some information to make it easier for the contemporary reader to understand the context of a lot of the things that Baladev said. So I didn't say, this is Baladev's commentary. No, I said, this is my commentary, because I added some information. I changed a few things that I thought were confusing. I didn't change the meaning, but I added more information to help the reader understand the meaning. You see? But I didn't try to pass it off as Baladev's work. I didn't put words in Baladev's mouth that he didn't write. See? I took my work and I added it to Baladev. And actually, in many cases, I didn't change even one word of Baladev's commentary where, where it was clear and easy to understand of, in the context of today's world. But where he was referencing um, obscure, well, what are obs to us today are obscure context, contexts, like the Upanishads and like that, I thought it was wise to introduce additional content like extended quotes from the Upanishads and so on like that. So I did. But I put my name on it. I took responsibility. If there's any defects in that commentary, they're only mine. They're not Baladev's. So I should take the responsibility for that. Huh? I shouldn't try to pass it off on him. So now if these editors are changing Prabhupada's books, make any mistakes, or if they change the meaning in a way that's not pleasing to Krishna, uh -huh. But they're not taking responsibility for it. They're trying to say this is Prabhupada's book. But it's not Prabhupada's book. Because Prabhupada is no longer here to approve their editorial changes. See, even in the book, uh, the ordinary world of academic literature, or, um, yeah, you know, so called serious literature, if somebody like James Joyce or Hemingway or somebody like that writes a book. Uh, now, while the, while the author is still alive, the publisher can go back and say, well, maybe it would make more sense if we present it this way or we change this or that or, you know, rewrite it here and there or leave this out or put that in or whatever. You know, and if the author says, yeah, okay, and agrees to it, then they can do that. But once the author has left this planet, left this world, the rule is, even with an ordinary writer, novelist or something like that, you, you don't change their books. You just don't do that. You know? 
or if you do, you document every single change and put footnotes and explain why you did it. And, you know, there, there's a whole protocol that's, that it's existed there in the academic world for centuries. How you deal with so-called uh, posthumous changes to a work of literature. But they're making thousands of changes and they're not documenting any of them. Uh, they're documented on some website somewhere, not in the book itself. So this is unprecedented. No, no, one, no one has ever done this before. Well, yeah, they have done it before and it's called boulderizing. After this guy in England named Boulder, who decided that some of the racier parts of the, of the standard uh, English works that are used to teach literature weren't suitable for our pure, delicate students. You see, so he took out those parts that he didn't like. Yeah. Well, you heard of Moby, right? The great book, Moby? About the whale? Yeah, about the whale. That's the one. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Moby. He didn't like the other word in the title, so he just took it out. It's not boulderizing, it's Bibleizing. Well, yeah. Moby. Same thing was done to the Bible. Anything that the powers that be don't like, they arrange to somehow uh, have it disappear from the world's literature and knowledge. So we don't believe in that. We don't accept that. We think that uh, people should have access to the complete knowledge and then let them make up their minds what they accept and what they reject. Huh? I mean, after all, it's their mind. Huh? So why don't we give them the uh, authority to determine what they're going to accept in their own mind? See, we recognize that every living entity is an independent, separate individual consciousness huh? and is the master of the field of activities, which is the body and the mind that they inhabit. Okay. We recognize the sovereignty of the individual soul, the living entity, over his own consciousness. And we support the right of every living being to make up his own mind. In other words, we don't believe in coercing people to think a certain way, to act a certain way, to believe or practice a certain path or a certain viewpoint on life or anything like that. Huh? I guess we're really old fashioned. <laughs> but, but we feel this is a, 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 this point of view, this style, this approach has much more integrity than trying to decide for others what they should have in their minds, what they should ha think, what they should be able to read uh, I'll never forget one time, one time I was approached by these Scientologists and of course they were trying to get me, you know how they always do, they try to get you to come down for a personality test and all this stuff and, and I said yeah well I've read some of L. Ron Hubbard's stuff and I think it's very interesting. And, uh, and oh, yeah, yeah, you should come down. Yeah, come on down. You know, we have all these courses and da-da-da-da-da. And then I went on. I said, and I'm really glad that he has done all this research and all these, all these, written all these books and stuff. And they said, oh, good, good, good. Yeah, you should come down and take our communication course and da-da-da-da-da and like that. And then I said, and... You know, I, I, what really makes me happy is that he did all this work because if he hadn't, I would have had to do it myself. <laughs> and, and the Scientologist, he turned, he turned white. Huh? He, was a, he was a Latino guy. This was in Miami. <laughs> and the guy, the guy turned white and he goes, you... You can't think that. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you see, I had read the same books that Hubbard read, especially Korzybski's Science and Sanity. I read it when I was 20 years old. Oh, it's a big, thick book. It's about like that. Huh? It's one of those books where you, you read one sentence and then you go, <laughs> What? <laughs> Did he just say what I think he just said? Oh my God. I'm going to read that again. Huh? And then you go, I mean, it's, and it's like every page is like that. Huh? So, um, and it's got these big, thick, meaty paragraphs, you know, like half a page long, one paragraph. And all these diagrams that look like they're from outer space or something. It's a really cool book. So I had read this book. And Hubbard had used this theory.